May I have your attention, please? I have to share a piece of sad news. One of our students from the third year BBA honors from the Jindal Global Business School, Kshitij Maurya is no more. Uh, he passed away today. And uh, as a mark of respect, may I request all of you to please stand up and observe two minutes silence. Thank you. I now request the Master of Ceremonies, Professor Upasana, to take forward this program. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here today, and good afternoon. It is my pleasure and a privilege to welcome you here today for JGU's 10th anniversary lecture series and today's lecture on Gender, Peace, and Security, Beyond Borders and Boundaries, by noted educationist, writer, political scientist, founder and director of WISCOM, Women in Security, Conflict Management, and Peace, Dr. Menakshi Gopinath. We are thrilled to have Dr. Gopinath with us here today. She has been a source of inspiration and motivation to many of us um, through her work and um, through her personality and she has inspired many, many of us to work in the field of gender, peace, and security. Thank you, Dr. Gopinath, for um, gracing us with your presence. May I now request Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, founding vice chancellor, OP Jindal Global University, to deliver his welcome address. My deepest condolences on the sad and untimely demise of one of our students. Um, it just happened, of, we came to know a few hours ago and we are obviously uh, shocked and uh, deeply anguished by what one of our students has gone through. But um, we will obviously have more information to share with you, but I, we had a choice to uh, make here to cancel this lecture or to have this lecture and do what we are expected to do. So we decided to do that and so we are hosting this lecture. I am grateful to Dr. Meenakshi Gopinath for not only accepting our invitation and also to be present here and to deliver one of the lectures of the 10th anniversary of OP Jindal Global University. The topic of this today's lecture is, a, is of great importance for the contemporary world and India, gender, peace, and security beyond borders and boundaries. As uh, Upasana mentioned, Dr. Gopinath is, uh, is one of those individuals who, have, who has inspired generations of students as well as teachers, not only in her contribution towards institution building, she was one of the most distinguished principals of the Shiram College of Commerce, uh, sorry, uh, Lady Shiram College uh, in, of the University of Delhi. And uh, we all know uh, LSR as a college, but what some of you may not know is that she championed a number of causes as a principal of LSR. Many students who studied at LSR have uh, vouched for the fact that Dr. Gopinath inspired them to determine their career choices and also their own uh, effort to make a significant contribution in the world at large. Um, I also want to mention that Dr. Gopinath has been a very active participant 
in efforts to build institutions. She has contributed to the establishment and evolution of number of academic institutions, non-governmental organizations, think tanks, research institutions, and galvanized both intellectual consciousness and social consciousness towards advancement of the functioning of those institutions. We are very, very fortunate that she is with us. Uh, I'm also grateful to her uh, that uh, she has known our existence for over a decade and always uh, championed our institution from outside and has always been a great source of inspiration, encouragement and support to me personally in this journey. Uh, I'm grateful to her for that support and I once again want to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Meenakshi Gopinath for, to our university. Thank you very much. Today's lecture topic is Gender Peace Security Beyond Borders and Boundaries. We all know that um, the nature of armed conflict has changed considerably in the past few decades from conflict between states to conflicts within them. Armed conflicts today are being fought due to quests for self-preservation, self self-determination, demands for fair access to resources, resistance to forces of acculturation and discrimination, and most often, a combination of such factors. With the blurring of the so-called lines between the war front and the home front, a vast burden of these conflicts are being borne by the civilians. Consequently, armed conflicts create new categories of vulnerabilities with the impact of conflict being borne disproportionately by men and women. This is not to imply that women are always the victims of violence and men are the perpetrators of violence when it comes to armed conflict. Women are engaged with armed conflict as combatants, as grassroots peace advocates, as targets of physical and sexual violence, as the bearers of contested communal identities, and as the group in society that is expected to sustain everyday life even under catastrophic conditions. Given these realities, we are deeply grateful to Dr. Gopinath for agreeing to speak to us today on the topic of gender, peace, and security beyond borders and boundaries. Before we request Dr. Gopinath to deliver her address, I would like to make an attempt to introduce her and her work. She's told me not to speak too much um, in the nature of an introduction, so I will say a few lines at least. Um, Dr. Minakshi Gopinath is the founder and director of WISCOM, Women in Security, Conflict Management and Peace, an initiative that began in 1919 to promote the leadership of South Asian women in the areas of international politics, peace, security, and diplomacy. She's also the principal emerita of Lady Sri Ram College, New Delhi, and she has served the college's principal for 26 years from 1988 to 2014. She has chaired the Saksham Task Force for the University Grants Commission, um, that was set up to review the measures for ensuring the safety of women on campuses and programs for gender sensitization. I say this because um, Jindal Global Law School is one of the few law schools in India who has taken up that recommendation. And we have gender and society as a core course, uh, which is currently being studied by the students at the law school. So thank you, ma'am, um, for that. Uh, Dr. Gopinath has received several awards including the Padma Shri. I am not delving into the others. She is an honorary adjunct professor, Lathrop Asia, Lathrop University, Australia, and visiting distinguished scholar, School of Social Sciences at 2015, Monash University, Melbourne, Australia. We deeply honored and thrilled to have Dr. Gopinath delivering this 10th anniversary lecture today. Uh, please welcome. I want you to project the, the 
जाए तो आप ये जैसे हम दोनों अटैच कर इसको बंद कर सकते हैं और इसको बाहर छोड़ना पड़ेगा और लाइक जो है स्वॉप में friends my deepest condolences on the passing away of your colleague and your friend and please i wish to extend my thoughts mm -hmm. to his family in particular <clears throat> vice chancellor professor rajkumar deans of faculties distinguished members of the faculty and students it's truly truly a privilege to be here today uh, especially because i'm in the midst of women and men whose ideas and scholarship propel us to engage with the possibilities of a more inclusive secure and humane world Upasna has kindly actually wrapped up my lecture for me so I really don't have much more to add however I do want to say that here at this university which has become an intellectual hub of a dynamic geographical confluence and where many roads and pursuits converge I feel particularly honored to be invited as you celebrate your decade of excellence in a span of 10 eventful years with eight schools that nurture innovation creativity and a unique teaching learning context jgu's trajectory has been nothing short of remarkable creating a formidable footprint in the educational landscape of the country the vision of its founder his sensitivity to aspirational india combined with the energy commitment and zeal of a dynamic institution builder my dear friend dr rajkumar has sent new benchmarks of scholarship the vice chancellor and his team have been hugely successful in transforming earlier perceptions and indeed the accepted discourse on the role efficiency and motivations of a private university In fact the goodwill and the international reach that JGU has so successfully gendered and garnered has been a game changer in raising the academic legitimacy and credentials of the private university in the firmament of higher education in India as a viable enterprise in service for the public good. I'm deeply conscious that I speak in a space and a context that is in many ways the hub of engagements on security and international politics it is the font from which emanates expertise that is of abiding value credibility and substance in the field so it is really with some trepidation that i speak here today the work of an initiative that i am associated with which is called wiscom sounds like an american corporation but it is not it's really an acronym for women in security conflict management and peace and it seeks to facilitate the leadership of women in the areas of peace security and international affairs it provides a unique interface between academia and the ngo sector and positions its work at the confluence of security studies conflict transformation and peace building and the intersection of these with gender concerns provides the focus of our work primarily its work reflects the perspective that gender is a cross cutting issue integral to these issues and it is not just an add women and stir kind of proposition even as we uh, attempt to breach traditional borders and boundaries so what you do as a space of international learning here truly resonates with our work My talk today attempts to focus on engendering security and it is an attempt to foreground some of the challenges and opportunities for peace building primarily in the South Asian region especially when seen through a gender lens. It also reflects in a sense the quest for an alternative vocabulary 
by highlighting some of the concerns of that half of the population, namely women who hold up half the sky, or so it is said, and whose voices are not often heard or reflected in the meta-narratives on national security. It draws on the emerging international discourse on women, peace, and security, which is now at least claimed to be a high priority for global systems of governance. In October 2000, the U United Nations Security Council, as many of you know, adopted Resolution 1325, which affirms the important role that women play in the prevention of armed conflicts and in peace building. And it calls on all actors, the states, the UN system, and non-state civil society to support and increase women's participation in decision making pertaining to the prevention and resolution of conflict and reconstruction processes. In response to persistent pressure from civil society, the UN adopted nine additional resolutions. The latest of that was 2070, 2272 in 2016, which addressed the issues of sexual violence, rape, and abduction as a weapon of war and exhorted zero tolerance for politics of any kind of gender discrimination. So 9, 1325 is a la was a landmark and it changed decisively the manner in which security and peace were hitherto seen. It overturned conventional ethnocentric, anthropocentric, and of course, androcentric notions of security. It was called the Women's Resolution, but it was primarily about peace and security. And to look at the contribution of women in terms of altering the substance of peace talks and peace accords. I know there are many among you who specialize on, on peace talks and peace accords, what is actually called the high table, high table peace. Uh, and UNSCR's 1325's attention to the protection of women's physical safety was highlighted at every stage of what, what was called mainstreaming, and I have a problem with that, with that phrase, mainstreaming gender consti uh, consideration into both peacekeeping, which is actually a, a military operation, peace building, and conflict transformation activities. But 1325, interestingly, was a bottom-up resolution. It was, it was initiated in the Global South, surprisingly. Uh, Anwarul Chaudhary of Bangladesh was its prime mover. And it was built on a major paradigm shift on understandings of security. But it did not emerge in a vacuum. It was the result of years and years of consistent hard work of women from the grassroots, networking across borders and boundaries, to form a critical mass and form what I would say a credible voice so that the, the sort of sanctified spaces of the United Nations had to, in some senses, <coughs> listen to reverberations that it had not heard before. This was piloted by the women in uh, in uh, Peace and Freedom, the Women's Initiative on Peace and Freedom, which was an initiative that had come into being in the early 1900s. The Women's Peacemakers Program, which worked primarily from the Netherlands, but engaged with several civil society institutions in the Global South. And it included a very interesting slogan, which was coined by the International Alert, from the village council to the negotiating table talking about how grassroots initiatives are absolutely crucial to building peace and that we need to really look beyond high table peace. 1325 plus, as it's called, including all the nine additional resolution, became a trajectory, a process that encompasses several ideas of protection, of participation, of representation, and of democracy. It, while breaking new ground, it allowed itself, as all such resolutions ought to, to be a continuous work in progress. And which is why 
Peace building then ceased to be, or peace ceased to be a noun. It became a verb, something that is determined or molded or nurtured or crafted by everyday resistances and daily mutinies. The year 2020 is potentially a watershed because it'll mark 25 years of Beijing platform for, or the Beijing Platform for Action, five years of the adoption of the famous SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which for the first time, it's not the Global North telling the Global South how to get their sanitation right, how to get their health right, how to get gender equality right, but it's a global compact which acknowledges shared responsibilities. And then it will also mark 20 years of 1325. Together, they provide the global normative compass of this millennium, on which the scripts and the rescripts of gender, peace, and security are being finessed. But it's also an invitation to re-envision this so-called global compact that engenders and foregrounds the link between sustainable development, security, peace, environment, democracy, and gender justice. The hard security versus soft development issues divide has been breached. The former traditionally seen as a masculine space and the latter as a feminized space. That is today thanks to the work of women who crafted 1325 Passe. Now the real challenge is to continue to breathe life into these and not sanitize them into checklists and tick boxes. The lifeblood of political engagement, especially from the field, needs to continuously feel, feed 1325 plus. And yet, because it is, it is nestled in UN in intentions, there is a real danger that it might get terribly sanitized, hijacked by theorists and scholarships who look at these issues not through the heat and dust of subaltern aspirations always. Joe Velocott, interestingly, Joe Velocott, who started her career as an engine mechanic and later as an en engineer officer during World War II, and then she quit it all to join the pacifist movement and became a Quaker, had this to say, and I, I'd like to quote this and share this with you. She says, women, peace, and power. I have let these th three words joggle around at the back of my head, hoping that they would fall neatly into place. But this did not happen. When I, when I put on my glasses to look at them, I found that the word peace, in juxtaposition with the word women, is seen to take on a sickly, flat, grayish pink color, very innocuous and very ineffective. And the word power, on the other hand, turns black and scarlet, almost threatening and sinful by association with women. When I move the word women off to stand by itself, a peculiar, ill-shaped question mark hung, hung over it. And as for the words peace and power, when I tried putting them together in my mind's eye, they behaved like two rather dreadful, magnetized toy dogs who jumped around to sniff suspiciously at each other's rear ends and refused to talk to each other or even refused to walk together. But fortunately, she says, after a short span, I found that the problem lay with the spectacles that I was using. So the changing of lenses is very integral to this whole enterprise of gender peace and security. The conventional notion of peace as the woman in white, the next slide please, wholly passive and passively holy <laughs> needs to be interrogated and is being inter interrogated. Women's peace building efforts today are situated in a theoretical framework that sees violence as a sort of resourcelessness and the traditional view of peacemaking as a lady in white, as an appropriate role for a well-behaved woman, is being challenged. We know that a stable situation is not necessarily a peaceful one. Women know that only too well. So a peace-directed person may be one on whom it is laid 
to challenge the system and to rock the ship of the state. As Rosa Parks did, for example. And she did this not because she saw, thought of herself as a peace activist, and you know, these seem to be sort of, this seems to be like a kind of contradiction in terms, but she did this just by quietly and stubbornly asserting her right to human dignity, by refusing to get off her seat in that segregated bus way back in 1955, because she refused to see herself, within quotes, as a nigger, and she decided that she was not going to be that one. She was glued to her seat and her dignity, and all she knew then was to sit still, and she did, but she got hauled off the bus and, she, and into jail, and she lit, and then of course into history, and she lit the fuse for social dynamite. So there are many, many ways in which women actually work for peace globally today. And today it's said, and many people say, it, that Rosa sat so that Martin could walk, and Martin walked so that Obama could run. So the, the larger spin-off of that one act of resistance was far beyond what could have been imagined at that particular time. So there's Rosa Parks for you. The changing discourse in security, which is influenced by the human security paradigm and critical security studies, interrogates the agenda of realism and its definition of politics based on the centrality of the state and its sovereignty. The imperatives of security conceived as both freedom from want and freedom from fear take the individual or people collectively as an important referent of security. So Mahbub al Haq's very evocative articulation of human security, and I think it resonates for us, especially in India today, which articulates human security as a child who did not die, a disease that did not spread, a job that was not cut, an ethnic tension that did not explode in violence, a dissident who was not silenced. This is a concern with human life and dignity. And so one of the most positive outcomes of scholarship in international politics, and your vice chancellor is, is an eminent uh, uh, scholar in the field of international politics and law, from the closing decades of the last century, has been really to generate a certain a, a uncomfortableness with the notions of security, that it is indeed a contested concept. And the feminist critique of traditional security, drawing largely from critical security studies, is critical of its professed gender neutrality. And women, therefore, who are most adversely impacted by the violence of conflict and war, and who constitute one third of the paid labor force, receive one tenth of the world's income, and own less than 1% of the world property, were seldom given either space or their due in what I call the meta-narratives on security. So feminist perspectives derive from very different ontologies and epistemologies than those in conventional security studies. Feminists have pointed out how the security-seeking behavior of states is legitimated by its association with certain kinds of hegemonic masculinity, asserting that theory should never be separated from practice Feminists have investigated the strategic language of foreign policy discourse to see how they shape, legitimate, and constrain certain policy options. So the conventionally accepted approach, as Upasana said, to armed conflict and civil strife portrays women as victims of the international system. But the need is to uncover a reality that is much less simple because women are not only victims, they're also consumers, they're workers, they're sometimes perpetrators of violence, and in this global system, their experiences need to craft the vocabulary of peace building. So today, women are entering this peace arena through the corridors of human security, and they are interrogating the culture of militarism 
and militarist models of state security. Now, many of their concerns, as you know, were or did find resonance in the UN summits in Beijing, Rio, Copenhagen, Vienna, Durban, and so on. And therefore, you see that impact gradually on what is called today the Sustainable Development Goals. And we do hope that those also don't end up becoming a checklist of, 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 shall I, do's and don'ts with several indicators that cannot even be unscrambled. But it's significant that Wangari Mathai, who is a Nobel laureate, speaking to the Conference on Climate Change in 2007, expressed the concern that women's voices are largely absent from policy discussions and negotiations around climate change. And this even while women are disproportionately affected by climate change, and for them the long walk for water and firewood, firewood really shapes the, the options for life and living, and indeed for livelihood. So we know about the famous Chipko movement, and I just want to leave this thought with you. Were the women of the Chipko movement who protested the felling of trees in Uttarakhand, what was the connection between them and Rosa Parks? Was there a connection? Were they doing things, were they doing things differently? Or were they doing different things? Or did they do different things because they were doing th diff things differently? So if women do speak in a different voice, as Kate Gilligan has often said when she talked about the moral development of women's consciousness, they're also looking at a counter-hegemonic politics. And so women feminists show how the reified language of techno-strategic discourse can often obfuscate and marginalize the individuals that are in involved. You reify it, you fetishize security so that the individuals that it's meant to impact are invisibilized in the process. And here again, uh, Carol Cohen, who wrote a very interesting piece called War, Wimps, and Women, in a book called Gendering War Talk, shares a very interesting example with us. And this was told to her by a colleague who was a, colleague who was a physicist. And he said, you know, several colleagues and I were working on modeling counterforce attacks, trying to get a realistic estimate of the number of immediate fatalities that would result from different deployments. At one point, we remodeled a particular attack using slightly different assumptions and parameters. And we found that instead of being 36 million immediate fatalities, there would be only 30 million. And everybody was sitting around the room and saying, oh yeah, that's great, only 30 million. When all of a sudden I heard what we were saying, and I blurted out, wait, I've just heard how we are talking. Only 30 million? Only 30 million human beings to be killed instantly? I said. Silence fell upon the room. Nobody said a word. They didn't even look at me. It was awful. I felt like a woman. The physicist added, that henceforth he was careful to never blurt out anything like that again. So when we hear words like strike capacity and collateral damage, we definitely need to begin to unscramble and see the human beings, the pain, the extinction that lies behind those reified concepts. So Women really, and feminists in particular, believe that the self-interested language of power brokerage tends to distort and diminish the vocabulary of connectedness, and that the calculus of power, which is so descriptive of much of international real politics, does not take cognizance of women's relationally defined existence, which results in a social understanding where everyday life is more valued, and a sense of connectedness and continuity with other persons and the natural world is central. So we do know that, for example, the word national security itself was coined, or shall I, drew from Laswell and drew from uh, uh, primarily Laswell, actually, and was used by Truman in, in the post-Cold War, uh, post War period, or during the Cold War period, 
to actually set up, in some senses, establishments like the CIA and to separate the Defense Department from the foreign policies uh, sector and so on and so forth. So it has assumed a certain mystique and, and, and a persona of its own, which has, which has to remain untouched, as I said, by the heat and dust of citizen aspiration. And people often talk about issues like drinking water, refugees, uh, uh, the violence of terrorism and so on, as though they belong to non-traditional security. I wish to submit to you that there can be no such thing as non-traditional security, although this is actually passed into formal security lexicon. You could have a non-traditional approach to security, but I still don't understand what non-traditional security stands for. So if you look at women, women as refugees, widows, victims, as workers in multiple economic roles without personal or family security have really become the markers of the emerging international scenario. We, we only have to look at, not, we don't have to go very far, we only look at, have to look at South Asia and the ubiquity of the camps, whether they are in Bangladesh, whether they are in India, whether they are in Afghanistan, in Swat, for example, even in Bhutan, in Nepal, across South Asia, Sri Lanka even today, the ubiquity of camps really brings home to you the starkness of how the state of exception applies there. And you all know what Agamben had said about the state of exception, where the state of exception, the extraordinary laws, the repressive laws become the norm of govern governance. And it is, in a sense, the state of exception has the power of decision over life. We, we don't have to go very far. We know about the NRC in India, which is an example. And what is particularly interesting is that we don't have any gender disaggregated data on what is going on in the camps. The Rohingya, the tragedy of the Rohingya today is only there starkly for all of us to see. So the state of exception, as I said, is always the exercise of the sovereign power, which is grounded in violence. You only have to look at the US Patriot Act and also the invoking of the UAPA closer home. So in South Asia, there is this tendency, as we know, of using draconian anti-people acts. We have the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which gave carte blanche powers to the security forces in the Northeast initially. It was extended to Punjab and to Kashmir in 1990. We have the Terrorist and Disrupt Disruptive Activities Act that gave vast powers to states in, in 1985. Tada, of course, was then, uh, then withdrawn. But we still have revoked, but we still have UAPA and PSA, and the impact of that is being seen. But movements with demands ranging from autonomy to independence in the northeastern states, in Nagaland, Manipur, Kashmir, Balochistan, Gilgit, Baltistan in Punjab, the Chittagong Hill Tracts in Bangladesh. We also are aware of Tamil Elam, which has sort of receded from immediate consciousness, but what is simmering there is something they don't always see. And of course, the Tarai region in Nepal. We see there, in all of these, how the state of exception is being given leg legitimacy and all the kind of excesses that are carried out pass off in, in the name of collateral damage. So we have, we've really, in a sense, we are talking about a new paradox where normalcy, as we knew it, at least as I knew it when I was growing up, has been turned on its head. You have that slide of Kashmir. Now, what is happening there is normal because law and order has returned normalcy to Kashmir. This photograph is not, is not very long ago, was not taken very long ago. So you have there the ballot, women going to cast their vote, and you have normalcy on the streets of Kashmir. So do women making peace engage with these kind of definitions? Are they fluid? Do they change? Can we infuse them with a different kind of meaning? These are questions 
that I would like to leave with you. The state apparatus itself and across countries, and today we have these, I wouldn't like to say the, use the word specter, but the reality of populist regimes across the globe, absolutely across the globe. Now in most, and especially in the global south, the state oscillates between the role of protector and predator, depending upon which particular group of the population it wishes to protect and which it wishes to act against. So it invariably acts against what we have termed the doubly disadvantaged. And invariably, the doubly disadvantaged ends up having a sizable population of women. We also are aware of how developmental projects cause death, loss of property, involuntary displacement, which suggests that there is a kind of peacetime war that is going on. I said earlier that peace is really not a noun. And women know that there is a continuum of violence that they face because of the complicities of family, community, and state. We know what development projects have done. We know that, in some senses, the displacement caused by the Narmada Dam became a metaphor, in some senses, for this kind of peacetime war. But it also became the flag of development. So when women do peace, or they enact, or they do peace, does doing peace also mean looking at structures of power that go beyond the concerns of just women? Does it mean providing an alternative vocabulary of rights and dignity? I would like to suggest to you that it does. And we know that along with the, move, the Narmada, uh, the, the protesters were led by a woman but I'm not sure how much of feminist vocabulary building happened at that particular time. And women in India have been in a, in the, at the forefront of many of the movements that, protect, that in, interrogate this kind of displacement and this kind of structural violence. So be it Koel Karo, be it Balyapal, be it Kudamkulam project against the Russian-built nuclear plant in 2012, women have been a very, very important and a sizable part of this. You, you may have heard of the Mal Malki Ya Moth movement in, in Pakistani Punjab, where the army held and tried to evict tenant farmers from agricultural land which the army wished to own. And there was a long, a very long struggle, which was called Malki Yamot, ownership or death. And women were at the forefront. And they used very innovative methods like using the rolling pin to, to kind of bring people together to the marketplace and a whole lot of mobilization techniques which were, which were innovative and new. But one of the most, uh, as, as we all know, and I think Upasna pointed to that, that across the globe, in situations of conflict, women and their bodies become markers of community honor. And it often becomes difficult for women to resist the patriarchies that are arraigned against them. As, they, as has been shown by various studies on communal conflict, women often get systematically mobilized by sectarian groups and end up internalizing the value system of these patriarchies. Many stories, there's this, there are many, many stories of women, both in India and Pakistan, who've jumped into wells to save the honor of their communities. But one of the most dramatic accounts of this, the biggest travesty of history in, in some senses, was what was unleashed by the recovery of abducted women after the Holocaust that followed the partition of the Indian subcontinent in 1947, in which one million people perished and over 10 million were displaced. Now the whole process of the recovery, and this was by very well-meaning people, bringing abducted women back to their own country, especially back to India, and rescuing them from their kidnappers, 
very often against their will, against their volition, because by then they had established relationships with their captors. Some had even married them, some had children from them. But in the name of nationhood, in the name of community honor, they were brought back and many of them disappeared, became invisible, lost either in Mathura or in, in the brothels of, of uh, several large cities. This, the same fate, in some senses, befell the Beranganas of Bangladesh, the women who had been molested and raped by the Pakistani army. They were the, the so-called violated women, but they were called Beranganas, and they were given the status of heroines by the Bangladesh government, but they were erased, they were invisibilized, and they did not, their children were not recognized as citizens, and the, the government itself, sought to keep them in camps away from the public glare, away from sort of this whole exciting project of nation building. And as you know, they languished unsung and unheard. So the play of identity politics has become so volatile in our region that it begs the question whether there is a stable national identity at all. And what does citizen mean? What does subject mean? These are all very gendered categories. Now we go, suppose we were to look at this whole business of displacement and the fact that war is very gendered and that it builds on certain notions of <coughs> certain constructions of masculinity. We know, for example, that the nowhere people, the people on the run everywhere, of whom the Rohingyas are the latest example, are primarily, most of them, the majority of them, are primarily women. And so the endemic violence of dislocation and involuntary displacement on account of conflicts and climate change within and between borders, and the whole process of so-called rehabilitation, resettlement, and, con and containment have fenced out large segments of our own people from public view and discourse. We are all also familiar with the, the, the tragic picture which actually captured global imagination of Alan Kurdi, who was, who was actually swept onto the beach when he was, his parents were trying to flee Syria. We also know what happens at the US-Mexican border, where really territory trumps humanity in this new paradigm of security. How much time do I have? Have I overshot my time? I have five minutes. Well, I have so much more to say. I haven't even got. We have our Q &A. Okay, we'll have a Q and A session. But I do want to say that women have brought very different kinds of methodologies of protests to the public sphere. And if you, sorry, for example, if you start with the women of the global north, the Greenham Commons women who pinned diapers and children's uh, drawings on a missile fence to stop it from being turned into a, 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 an, an arena of missile building. Whether you have the Madre de la Plaza, the Mayo in Argentina, the White Scarves movement, the movement of the Kenyan Vajir group that marched in procession calling for the return of disappeared children. Whether you had the Mira Paibis much later, uh, where they protested the Indian army actions against their, uh, uh, their sisters and brothers by shooting them, uh, you know, innocent bystanders. And Iram Sharmila's fast unto death, whereby she, in some senses, used the ritual of inversion, and the Mira Paibis did, by saying, this is my body, and it was a very sort of chilling kind of uh, poster that they hung up, which said, Indian Army rape us. Which was almost like saying that you use my body as a marker of community honor. You use it to shame your adversary. I am going to invert it and talk about the fact that my body becomes the site of my protest. So there are several, several, several uh, you know, examples, whether it's the women in Ireland, whether it's the women in South Africa, whether it's our own uh, women, the Naga Mothers Association that came up with this slogan called Shed No More Blood, 
mediating between warring ethnic tribes, uh, mediating between soldiers and the so-called militant groups. There is a whole array of methodologies that women have brought to the public space, bringing very personal, private artifacts and saying, the continuum of violence from the public to the private is something we have to oppose, and that is what constitutes peace building. It's not just peacekeeping. We, have, we did have our women uh, peacekeeping force in Liberia. It was the all women's Indian peacekeeping force. But we, rem we need to remember that from its original blue helmet origins, it has now evolved into a peace building function. The peacekeeping forces, whether they were in East Timor or in Cambodia, gradually have morphed into supporting elections, in Timor-Leste, for example, they ensured that 27% women got into the constitution-making process. And that was a first, as did happen in Nepal, for example, after the Janot Andolan and the end of the Maoist struggle. Women in Nepal have also crafted national action plans, which are integral to the 1325. But there are many, many such stories, but when we re problematize security, we need to understand that women need to move beyond the discourse of victimhood or the icon of mother sorrow and look at how agency and victimhood is a complex dialectic and that it is constantly being constructed and reconstructed depending upon the context. So the idea is to wrest the notion of security from elite pastons and bring it into the public sphere of democratic dialogue and debate. Luckily now, thanks to 1325 and the many reviews that, have un that, have, that it has undergone, there is some introspection about how it is important not to, de not to sanitize it or depoliticize it. And, I, and Radhika Kumaraswamy of Sri Lanka was a famous I was a very important mover in this process about re-problematizing re uh, security. I, I, I think for, for many of us who work in the area of peace building and work in the area of gender and peace building, it's important to remember that there are structural constraints. The cultures of war, the warrior discourse is drumming up support, unprecedented support, from acro across the globe, but we work with structural constraints, but there are also enabling spaces. So how do we bricolage around that? How do, we, how do we build transversal solidarities? How do we transgress every day? How do we change the terms of the state of play, the terms of interaction? This, in, in, in a sense, or in some, is, is really the stuff of what women's peace building is all about. But I, want, I don't want to end, I just before I end, just two things. Today, thanks to the, shall I say the, I wouldn't like to call it the awakening of consciousness, but thanks to the realization that women are integral to any peace building activity. And it's not just high table peace or signing of peace accords, but how powerful they can be around the peace table and also how well represented they are in parliaments that their voice can begin to impact and refashion this vocabulary. So we often say, let us exhort both men and women, because this is about gender, it's about uh, constructions of masculinity, it's about hyper-masculinism as well, and it's also about men who are feminists who are working with us to push the borders and the boundaries of this discourse I think the idea is that more and more of us must begin to speak in the mother tongue. And I don't believe, I'm not talking about the literal mother tongue, I'm not talking about Punjabi, Urdu, Malayalam, or Tamil, I'm talking about the metaphoric mother tongue. The mother tongue which is the language of inclusion, often on the verge of silence, but also always on the verge of song. The language in which maps can change, can be rewritten, the language that can speak to, uh, truth to power. The language that once Aung San Suu Kyi employed, but 
the language that more and more women need to put out as the credible alternative vocabulary. Uh, and so today, uh, I'd, I'd like to share with you that post 2000, post 1325, there have been a larger proportion of women who have been recognized for the Nobel Prize than ever before. Can we go to the Nobel slide? Yeah. And you'll be interested to know that post 2000, most of them come from the global south. So that is telling you something about, I don't know whether it is an atonement or whether it is a, it is a recognition of the work on the ground, that post 2000, when 1325 was actually adopted, you have far more women Nobel Peace Laureates than you've ever, ever had before. But even so, out of a total of 89 men since 1901, you have only 17 women, but we are getting there. And I'd like to end with something that, uh, I would like to call him a guru of sorts. Uh, he's an iconoclast and, and he, he resides within the precincts of this great university. Uh, Dr. Shiv Vishwanathan had said once about peace. He said, peace is not a target, it is a process. It's not a building. And he said this in the context of a discussion on Kashmir. But a tool and a toy, it's like a kaleidoscope. It is both robust and fragile. After all, a kaleidoscope is a bit of cardboard, a few rubber bands, a bunch of broken bangles, the broken bangles are important, and these are all sticking hopefully together, hopefully together. Peace is a perpetual hypothesis, a matrix of pain and promise, tested and verified each day. A people's peace cannot be an expert's peace. And to this I would like to add, peace is a plea it's an invitation to society to invent and reinvent every day the song of democracy. And I'd like to end by saying that those of us who wish to sing will always find a song. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gopinath, for that truly riveting um, and nuanced understanding of gender, peace, and security that you offered to us. Um, it was like a master class on understanding the nuances of gender, peace, and security. We do have um, a brief question-answer session that, that will follow. Um, but before that, uh, may I request our Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, to kindly felicitate our distinguished guest. <laughs> 